Hello and welcome to episode 44 of the 905er podcast. My name is Roland Tanner. I am Joel McLeod. And today we're talking about schools again and it seems that education in the 905 region is seldom out of the news. This week's story revolves around the appointment in York Catholic District School Board of someone with only three years of experience as a teacher at a private school uh, under rules introduced this summer by the provincial government. The appointment has provoked uh, considerable outrage among some of the parents and students. To dig into why there's been such a negative reaction, we've invited back Cindy Cosentino, who was our first ever podcast guest back in August of last year. Cindy retired last year after 32 years as an elementary and high school teacher in Hamilton and Halton school boards, including periods working at the Ministry of Education, and has now been kind enough to provide the benefit of her extensive experience and understanding of Ontario schools. Yeah, so uh, welcome back to the podcast, uh, Cindy. Um, great to have you back again. And um, as we we're just saying before we came on, yeah, you're our uh, <laughs> our unpaid education correspondent. <laughs> um, and uh, we've invited you back on to discuss a couple of things to do with what's going on with schools at the moment, uh, and in particular this uh, appointment in. Um, York Catholic uh, District School Board of a new uh, education director, um, Robert Hofstadter, uh, which has caused some uh, controversy. And uh, maybe you could uh, kick us off, Cindy, with just um, kind of what's going on. I mean, just from my point of view, what is an education director and why this has become a a controversial point for, for many people? So traditionally, a director of education, the, the progress through the school system is usually uh, you start off as a teacher, you spend however many years teaching in a public school, which is Catholic or non-Catholic. Uh, you will take your PQP, which is principal's qualification courses. You will interview sometimes frequently to become, or many times before you become a vice principal, then you move into principal role. Once you're in that, if you want to continue, you may be Uh, considering becoming a supervisory officer. There are more courses, more learning, and then you can apply for positions there. And then from there, you may move into a director's role. So by the time you have become a director of education in the past in Ontario, you have been in a classroom, probably many classrooms. You've been a principal of a school, probably many schools or several, and you have held the role of uh, superintendent. So you bring to that position um, knowledge of a, a school board system at many levels. So this is quite a departure from that process. And uh, so, and, and just so, so we're clear, like the, the current controversy is, uh, it stems back from a change that the, the current provincial government made to the Education Act, if I'm not mistaken, allowing uh, for uh, school boards to look beyond those qualifications that you had, that you had mentioned in their search for an education director. Right. From what I understand, they removed the, uh, the requirement that you had to be a certified teacher, which means you also don't have to be a principal or a superintendent because to be a principal or a superintendent, you have to be a qualified teacher. So by re- removing that, you've eliminated those, um, those other qualifications. So you could have someone who, And in this case, this person does have their OCT. They are a qualified teacher in Ontario. So they are meeting that minimum requirement, but they do not have the other two parts that are typically what you see for a director, which is the superintendent experience and the administrator experience. Now, why why do you think the government might have made this change? I mean, is there any evidence that the system as it existed before didn't work uh, or or (laughs) is there something else at work here do you think? I have always been very proud to to work in the Ontario system. Um, We're top 10 in the world in math and I think we're seventh overall when they do PISA testing internationally. It's a good system. It works for for kids and we have better outcomes when it comes to equitable outcomes than many jurisdictions. So it's a system I've been very proud to work in and be a part of. So I don't think there was anything broken about the Ontario education system. I know I I am biased. I get that. But even looking at objective data from outside Ontario, I felt like uh, we were doing well by the kids that are in our system. 
so the, I mean, the, the rationale that I understand it is that it's just throws the net. You're able to cast the net so much further and wider, and you're able to draw from a deeper pool uh, of talent to to fill this role. Because I mean, th- this role it really it is. You're essentially, I mean, if to analogy analogize it, a CEO of the school board. I mean, you're you're yeah. covering millions of dollars in expenditures. Uh, you're authorizing, um, you know, b- major build and major infrastructure investments in terms of school remodelings or school um, builds, uh, if need be, for new new schools, hiring, uh, contract negotiations. Like it's a it's a huge. Uh, responsibility to to sit there and have to negotiate these uh lar- large contracts on behalf of the taxpayer yes but in a school board you have your academic you have two types of supervisory offers officers you have your academic ones who are in charge of schools and education and the learning side of it and you also have financial um capital, you have all of those people too to guide you. So it's not like the director has to know everything about all things. You have people with expertise who were formerly civil engineers or, you know, CFOs in an organization Mm -hmm. who can be hired to do those roles. So you do have non-academic supervisory officers to advise and guide a director. Uh, And I believe that, well, I actually, I know that the justification that the Minister of Education, Stephen Lecce, gave back in the summer was that, well, by doing this, we, we, we widened the pool and he actually pointed to the lack of uh, uh, directors of education from, from visible minorities, which there's a number of interesting points coming from that. Uh, certainly it's true that of the 72, and I'm just reading from uh, the Toronto Star here, some people know I'm <laughs> I'm copying this from three of the 72 directors of education in the province are of visible minorities, which is, I would imagine, far, far, far below the the kind of ratios in the population at large. Um, so that's a fair point. However, Mr. Hofstadter is um, certainly not a visible minority. Um, it, it seems a very... Well, when I was thinking about this, uh, you can comment when you think this is a fair comment or not. I was surprised that that comment didn't attract more attention at the time, because the implication is there aren't enough good teachers who are visible minorities in Ontario to fill the director of education post, which I would think is deeply, deeply offensive to anybody who is a visible minority working in uh, the Ontario uh, schools. Well, I, I just to, I'm going to jump in there. I would argue... Your point is is kind of valid there, uh, Roland. But I would also look at say maybe to look at what barriers are in place in the mobility of teachers who are of minor who are of uh, uh, identified minority status. Uh, what's their ability to move up through the ranks if they want some kind of career advancement? If they want to expand their their base of expertise, you know how how easy it for is it for them to to do so? So that they can one day say, "Yeah, I'm going to throw my hat in the ring to become an executive or uh, education director." Yeah, there's a lot of systemic issues that need to be addressed uh, rather than just catapulting directly to the top position. Which, honestly, I, I taught 32 years in the system. You couldn't pay me enough to be a director of education. That is a job that is so complex and so nuanced. And to imagine going into that with such uh, limited experience, it, it's it's very it would be very uh, terrifying to anyone who has been in a school teaching in a public school, I think. Well, well let's, let's, any... let's talk about uh, Mr. Hofstetter's uh, expertise as to why he got the job. Um, according to, uh, to reports, he's only, he's only been a teacher, a uh, teacher for three years, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and, 18, yeah. and his, and that was in a, a private uh, institution, not a public. Uh, and then, before that, he made his uh, name in cybersecurity for Scotia Bank, which is a, a, quite an admirable position. I mean, that that, that he d- clearly does have education and a drive to to do that. So kudos to him for that. But I mean, what can you t- maybe comment? Like, how how does that make him qualify to become a uh, director of education for your Catholic district school board? 
I don't know. And I, I don't know. I mean, I, I looked over his qualifications. You can go on the College of Teachers and look at, you know, all the additional qualification courses when they were certified, etc. And he seems, and, and all of his other degrees, he seems like a very smart, capable person who's done extremely well in his field. And I have no doubt is highly capable with the, the skills that are necessary, but I still believe you need some underpinning understanding of the system and how it works. I also have the mindset of coming from the private sector to the public sector. It's a very different world that there are, it's a very different outcome we're looking for. Directors are all about student achievement mm -hmm. and student outcomes. It's not about bottom lines financially or, you know, it's, it's a very different metric that you use in a school board to determine success. It's also extremely nuanced in terms of the relationships you have with your superintendents, your teachers, um, your trustees, elected people, your federation, there are unions involved. It's extremely complex. And without any experience navigating that, and you're right, even the teaching experience he's had has been in a private school. So all of that, it was a single standalone school. It wasn't even a school system. So uh, I, I think it's, uh, uh, well, there's an important uh, additional point we can add there. Uh, the school is St. Michael's College School in Toronto. Uh, would you care to guess who else went to that school who's <laughs> currently involved in our education system? That would be the yeah. Minister of Education, Stephen yes. Letching. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. It's definitely. And, 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 that, and, that, and that is, his writing is in that board. Um, it should also be pointed out as well. Um I, I, I'm 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 curious to know, like I, I think you make a good point there, Cindy, about the outcomes are very different. That um I, I mean we we obviously we don't want school boards to go over budget and to have runaway expenses, obviously. But that doesn't really ha happen all that often here in Ontario. I, mean, I maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I mean for the most part, the and I'm being general here, uh uh School boards are pretty well run financially uh, in, in the province. Am I wrong on that on that assumption? That is my understanding, and I know there have been instances where school boards were taken over by the ministry to deal with issues uh, with financial mismanagement or poor management. But my understanding is, for the most part, they are uh, well. I mean, it's there's lots of oversight. It's certainly not something that can be done in private. So there are lots of eyes on the school board and their finances. And my, my understanding as naive as it may be was that it, that was not a, a huge area of concern. However, the word efficiencies gets used a lot when someone gets pulled in from private sector. And that's where I'm concerned because someone might be, and I think the current government is really good at finding efficiencies and not really understanding the implications of those efficiencies on people. And I, my fear would be Someone who doesn't understand uh, a public school system, the students that it is serving, the families that it is serving, may see an efficiency and not understand completely the repercussions of that efficiency. And I would hope the trustees would guide in that decision making and the superintendents would as well. Uh, but it just it feels like a gap in their understanding to me. And I hope I'm wrong for the students in that school board. I hope that this turns out to be someone who is able to figure this out on the ground very quickly and understand the system. And that would be my dream, but I am very leery of. Well, I mean, it, I, I kind of talk with a bit about that private public di uh, dichotomy there that the, uh, you know, in, in the private sector, you're able to negotiate kind of one-on-one, -on -one, one entity to another for a mutual beneficial outcome. I find that public education is very different because as a parent of a child in the system, I'm involved. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm involved at, at, uh, in my child's in the school. Uh, I, I'm, I'm involved somewhat at the board level of just, you know, paying attention to what's going on. And it's, it's, I find that the, the, it's very different from a private sector to a public sector that, you know, there are a lot more eyes on you in the public yeah. sector than, than in the private. I mean, that's, Everybody talks about how the, uh, the the public sector, oh, nothing is done. It's all full of incompetence. I would argue, no, private sector's done probably has just as much incompetence or just as much screw ups. We're all human, after all. The problem is, everybody pays attention to, to the pri uh, to the public sector because we're all invested in it. Yes, I 100% I agree. Um, I think 
I believe the people, I mean, I've only known, I have the utmost of respect for the people I've worked for that were superintendents and the directors, because I know, I, I can see as I've moved through the system, the complexity of the job. And you're right, there, every parent in every classroom, the, this director will be talking to parents. Someone tweeted something about wait till, I think it was wait till someone shows up wanting to know why Susie can't bring her bunny to class. Yep. And it's like, yeah, no, <laughs> you're dealing with that and you're dealing with multi-million dollar budgets and like I said, unions, all the other aspects of it that are, it's so nuanced and complex. And uh, I hope he has a good team to support him. It, yeah. And, and time will tell. And we, we have to accept, you know, in this individual case of this individual gentleman, uh, absolutely. I think we have to do that. Uh, yeah. Those are the rules that are now in place. We can just uh, raise an eyebrow, certainly at some, at some of the coincidences. I think in terms of, of, of um, uh, what was Bill 187, Bill 187, correct me if I've got that number wrong. 197, um, I believe. 197. Yeah. I think it was numbers. This is why I did very badly at math at school. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you know, the, the, this was sold to us as, as enabling uh, greater diversity, which would be a yes. good thing. And also uh, uh, the phrase used was a generational change. Now, I mean, uh, I'm not particularly seeing Mr. Hofstadter as, as a generational change. Let's just put it that no. way. Um, <laughs> no. He's probably I, I, about my age. Or, but, no, yeah, I was I not. Mean, yeah. No. Unless you're talking about an old generation. <laughs> um, yeah. it, it, it just speaks to, to my mind don't let me put words in your mouth, the dishonesty of the government in how they were selling this change and that it actually does nothing for visible minority uh, teachers working within the school system to, to make it easier for them to apply for these jobs and to overcome the inherent um, systemic problems that tend to count against people from visible minorities getting to the top level. Uh, and it does... All it means is that people without qualifications can now apply for a job that they need to not to be able to apply for, and, and I just um, it, I find it maddening. But um, do you think any of that is unfair uh, as a comment from someone? No, I, and I think <laughs> like I, I was looking up the board, just curious about what's been going on, and I found last November their students staged a walkout to protest what they're perceiving as racism in their classrooms, and. So there's obviously something going on in this board where the students are identifying a problem. You have to listen to your kids. They know what's going on in the classroom. And if they're saying there's a problem, there's a problem. So this is um, a little bit of a, I would think to that student organization that was kind of a grassroots organization that formed, this is a really troubling development. This doesn't, this isn't a good signal that they've well, listened to them. Well, we, we actually extended an invitation to that organization to come on this podcast and we want to hear from them and uh i'll i'll, re I'll reiterate uh if anyone from that organization is listening to this episode by any chance uh please contact us because we very much want to talk to you about your side um i i but i i i want to i want to talk kind of what roland was just talking about about this you know the idea of oh we're going to cast the net wider and more diverse and all that i'm I, i'm curious to know like maybe you know the the idea of like we need we need to uh, go outside the the pool that we normally draw from for this job. I'm thinking, I I don't think he, that Mr. Hofstadter necessarily has the right qualifications. He ha he has a depth of knowledge. He he is very well versed in his field, no question about it. But at the fit for this job, I question. Time may tell, and I may be proven wrong. I'll I'll leave that out there. But I'm wondering like. Would Scotia like flip it the other way to fill his job at Scotia Bank? Would Scotia Bank be going to the former, for to to like a director of education to say, "Hey, do you want this job?" You know, yes. <laughs> the the the, the, this, our, the former guy who had this job went to go to a to cover a school. Are they going to go start knocking the door of a few of the um, uh, school boards around the province and saying, "Hey, do you guys want this job?" I don't yes, think so. That's, I it seems to be a one way anyone can do education. Anyone can be a teacher. We can put uncertified teachers in the classroom. We can 
put anyone in the director's role, but it doesn't go the other way. You know, being a director doesn't qualify you to be a CEO in any organization that I'm aware of. Uh, I looked up hospitals because that's the one that you often hear is, well, you don't have to be a, a doctor to be a CEO of a hospital. And it's true, but most of them have quite extensive experience in healthcare. They may not be physicians, but they've worked in the field and have an understanding of the context quite extensively. Um, so I, I was wondering the same thing. I wonder if Scotiabank will be considering hiring a former director for that role. And I and again, I know there are skill sets that would transfer, but without the foundational understanding of the system, it would be really tough to be the director of of cybersecurity without any background in cyber cybersecurity. Right. Well, or sure that you've worked spent, in it for two years. If, if you spent three years with Microsoft Windows, I'm sure you can do it. <laughs> Sorry, uh, we, we will not be getting a, we will not be getting a partnership with Microsoft after this episode. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it's a very good question, though, and I mean, it's um, the other part of this that I mean resonates personally is, like I said, I've worked with a lot of administrators, SOs, directors that I really respect. I respect their skill set. I respect the career that they've had and the knowledge they bring to the table. I've I've appreciated and admired how they've worked in such, I mean, look at this year for a superintendent. I know a few of them personally, and they have not stopped working. Like it is full out all the time. And I appreciate that they are understanding of the system is nuanced and they're balancing all of the demands. It feels like none of that is about as valued when you hire someone. It feels like all of the experience and knowledge of education that comes from a career in education is not valued when you can hire someone who has so little of it, if any. In this case, he does, but not much. Well, I, I just to what you touched upon, though, like this year has been extraordinary for educators at every level of yes. the field, from from the the substitute teacher all the way up to the directors of education. Um, I might show my bias here, but I think most have really just stepped up to the plate again and again and again to hit it out of the park for our, our kids and, and families. Um, but I think the the ramifications of this year are going to be felt down the road. There's, there's talk of revamping the system so that we, we might have more um, online learning to substitute snow days, um, which I, I think is a kind of an interesting idea to pursue. I think there's not, there's, it's an interesting dynamic. There's also talk of just greater focus on children's mental health. Um, you know, we, we've I've I've heard from parents that they're just like you know, going to lockdown, coming out of lockdown. It's just it's stressing out my kid, understandably. And like I think we're we're seeing there's there's rumors or there's talk of we need to start refocusing our education system on a little bit more on, on some mental health well-beings and whatnot. I think that there's going to be a lot of repercussions after that. Also the fact that I think we're, our kids are a little behind in education. I'm not stressing out over because everybody's behind, but let, let's face it. We're all a little behind. It's, it's going to be talk about trying to pick up the pace. What's going to, what's going to be the future of education. Um, I know I'm rambling here, but it, it, to me, I look at say like, don't you want somebody with a background in education who understands the the principles behind it, how teachers try to impart information to students, how students receive that education, what's what's the 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 practical aspects of it versus the theory that you that you learn about in uh, in your in getting your certificate, those kind of things. Like there's a there's a lot of nuance there that you want to draw from a depth to sit down at the table and say, I, you know what, we think we should start entertaining plans A, B, and C or, or something like that. I agree. And I speak like there's so many different, very good policy documents on mental health. I mean, that's been a, a document that we've been working with in the in school boards for years now, um, creating pathways to success, making sure students have um, all sorts of interesting opportunities to figure out what they want to be starting very early in their progress through the system so that they have something, a plan that they're working toward. Like there's so many nuances. Equity and inclusive education is huge where that is such a, an enormous focus right now. And that is, it's a lot of work and a lot of learning. Like I, I feel like I've, 
I'm only at the beginning of that, even now learning what that is and how to do that and how to bring that into a classroom. Thinking about how to change a system to be anti-racist and to remove systemic barriers. That's a life's work. Yeah, uh, that's, I just, that's a lot of learning that has to happen. And if you don't have all of that foundational knowledge and you haven't been um, kind of moving along, learning as these things have been coming out, it, it would be a lot to catch up on. Mm-hmm. So uh, I just run another hypothesis by you. And I guess my hypothesis would be that, that the province isn't interested in any of that. Their primary interest is the next time the teachers are negotiating uh, over salaries with them. Um, and the one big advantage over hiring an outsider is that person never will have been a uh, member of any of the teaching unions, has not come from within the system where you may be senior staff now uh, and not part of the uh, the union system, but you probably were at some point um, when you were a, a, a teacher, which is a regular teacher. Um, so this is about, and, and uh, you know, again, the Catholic school boards tend to the, the the trustees tend to skew somewhat, and I say tend because there are many exceptions, but they tend to skew somewhat to the right because of the religious aspect of the Catholic school boards. Uh, we've certainly seen that in other other um, uh, school board districts in the recent past. Um, uh, that they are looking to how do we uh, how do we get someone in who's not going to do it uh, who's going to kind of fight the unions basically? Um, do you th- again, I fully admit I just pulled that out of the air and it's a hypothesis. But do you th- think that might be something that's going through anybody's head? Well, I know that that's the fear is that this is another um, step on the way to privatizing our system and dismantling what has been, I think, like I said, a very functional, effective, publicly funded system with good outcomes for many people, like most children have good outcomes. uh, And that this is one of the things that will start to dismantle that and take that away and and change the structure of what we see as education. I know that is a fear. Um, I can see why that's a fear. It certainly has felt like, and I'm not a teacher in the classroom this year, but I know my last year in the system, it felt very, uh, the government feels intentionally antagonistic toward teachers. I'm intentionally antagonistic toward unions. And I think their agenda from the beginning has, privatization has been on a threat in education since Harris. Um, We've been dealing with that looming threat whenever there was a conservative government. And I don't believe this government's any different. So, I, I see why people are suspicious of that. And, and certainly, I mean, this this appointment was made by the trustee, will have been made by the trustees of York District Catholic District School Board. Um, yeah, I mean, and I haven't looked at, but very often, well, it's a much bigger subject. The the, the um, some of the problems with trustees um i think we've seen in the last week and we're not going to talk about this today but in the last week in hamilton went with school board um the uh report on some of the trustees there and and how they related to one of the student trustees is if you read the report pretty troubling um it it's a shame because all statistics tell us that ontario has a really good school system and that in terms of results it holds up, like you said at the beginning, with some of the very, very best in the world. And yet it feels like there are these agendas at work. Um, and certainly, you know, again, um, you know, there are those people out there like, well, the teachers are paid too much to get the whole summer off. You know, all the old cliches uh, are out there and find their home, I suspect, in um the PCs. <laughs> well, it's felt like a lot of fake news. It's been very frustrating when you've worked in the system and you know what happens for your students in that system. And then the public hears that they hear EQAO scores and therefore we are doing terrible in math. It's like, we're not doing terrible in math. We're doing okay. Like really we're fine. We're at the top of the world in terms of how our students are performing. But the spin is that it's terrible. There's something broken here that needs to be fixed. 
And, or, and the whole, uh, which was basically this kind of old nonsense of, well, you know, we need just to hit, sit them down and whack them on the back of the knuckles with a stick until they learn their their uh, times tables kind of nonsense, yes. which yeah. is just, again, I actually grew up in the system where they still kind of did that, and boy, did it not work for me. <laughs> I, I'll, um, just, I'll just say, I think that the new, and this is completely on a sidebar, the new system works wonders. Um, my kid is picking up math a lot faster than I did when I was their age. Um, I, 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 I hear your point. Like the EQAO, that's a mouthful is a, I think it's controversial to begin with. Um, it's, but to kind of bring it, bring it back to our, our original point of just, yeah, I, I see your point though, of the, the move to privatization. I mean, that this government has been, laser focus on teacher uh, 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 satisfaction, teacher health. Like I, I, I can't think of a, the last time a government has, was that focused on, in terms of educational reform, it was just on uh, union uh, disruption. Uh, I mean, I... I, I, I Please don't say laser focus because every time Mr. Lecce says that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But I, 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 but I, I will say it, it is apt because I've, I can't think of a single, I'm trying, I'm, I'm going over my head here. I'm like any other major policy uh, change to the education ministry. I really can't think of anything that's really substantive other than wanting to go in and re. Change, uh, uh, change the bargaining structure or the bargaining agreements uh, of the unions, which it's one part of it, yeah. But I, I, as a parent, I'm more concerned about the the education. I, I part of it, I think, it comes back to the fact that they tried to uh, repeal the sex ed curriculum to uh, uh, satisfy the social conservative portion of their party and that blew up in their face um mostly because people said fine if you're going to replace you want to replace with something replace with something modern and they couldn't because it was pretty modern and it worked uh yeah right there has been a definite target painted on teachers and it's been deeply felt um the people i work with are in the profession for all the reasons that you would want a teacher to be in the profession and it's been really dispiriting and discouraging even before the pandemic when you you were very aware of the fact that you were being painted publicly as um, lazy, entitled, overpaid, underperforming, like all of the things that are either explicitly or implicitly said by this government. It's really, it's it's been so discouraging. But I, on a time to work, I, I, I was just going to say, I know that they, they were trying to paint teachers as that. I don't think it worked because if you look at, try and remember back pre-COVID, it was a lifetime ago. I know we we're all a lot younger and a lot thinner, but it-, it Speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> but it, I mean, our, I mean, this, this party was, uh, this, sorry, this government was not well liked. Um, if you remember like this time last year, we were doing, we were facing rotating strikes by teachers uh, unions. And for the most part, the teachers who, the parents who were affected were on the side of the unions. Most of the, uh, most public sentiment was on the side of the unions. They were looking at, this was unnecessary action on part of the uh, Ford government. It, people were, were wondering, why don't we just solve it? Like this, nobody was asking for this. And the only thing that saved their bacon was the pandemic because the pandemic hit and all of a sudden people were just like, we got to get something signed. We got, we got to put this behind us because we got to deal with the pandemic. And it kind of saved their butts out of the fire in terms of the, the disruption they were facing on the education file. Um, and then everybody focused well, I also on think They also could build their narrative a little bit because the perception some people have, I, I agree that there was support for teachers, but generally only parents in the system who knew what was really going on. The general public who isn't engaged with a public school right now doesn't know and can only go based on what they're hearing in the media, which is often inaccurate, misrepresenting it. 
But the pandemic, the narrative in the spring was that teachers were off <laughs> from when the schools shut till June. Nothing was happening. In reality, teachers were scrambling and without technology, without right. their own, with kids at home. I mean, it oh, was yeah. chaos. It, it was. I and mean, what I, people I was, pulled together. I was one. Of, I was one of those parents. I was one of those parents that you know we were. You know, the teacher's like, I, I don't like. No, this was not part of my lesson plan. I didn't. <laughs> and nobody wrote down, "Hey, COVID nineteen, what do you do?" Um, and I, I mean, I, I think that came. That would. That, I think I do think it's unfair to bl- lay that at anyone's doorstep because nobody knew that this was coming, and I'm. I'm I would not blame Minister Lecce for for that. I'm going to blame my my kid's teacher. Like. I, it was just, it was a shitty situation all around and people just did the best that they could with shit that they were handed. However, I would say that this time around, um, it's been a lot better as a parent. I've noticed it. Um, I think that my, at least in my kid's school and from what I've heard of other kids' schools, the parents, the teachers have really stepped up. The administrations have stepped up to really kind of, okay, where were the gaps last time? Let's take, let's learn no pun intended. Let's learn learn what failed last time and correct it now. And for the most part, I think they really stepped up. Um, they, there's still c- confusion about whether or not we're, it's safe to open schools now, which we're we're learning. We're well re- this week we reopened schools. I want to say most of the nine to five, my except for uh, for Peel region. How's this going to work out? I I don't know. I mean, at, at this point, I kind of shrug my shoulders and say, okay, let's hope for the best. Because I I don't I can't, I'm not going to rack my head around over numbers and 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 what have you. It's crazy. It, it's it's been an amazing year for, for when I say amazing. I mean amazing is not the right word. It's been a uh, astonishing. I, I'm trying to put into words the the extraordinary nature or an extraordinary year for for education, and I think. Uh, teaching staff have done uh, wonders um, in such an impossible situation and um, with not enough support from from the ministry certainly and and I I my feeling is that 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 you know what we're talking about today is just part of an uh, of the agenda of who has the strongest unions in Ontario well the teachers unions are, are very effective um and have been for a long time and this government cannot abide that and i don't know if it's privatization that they have at the end or other end but i bet they have uh breaking the unions at the, uh, as as an objective number one um and that trumps any interest in actual the quality of education of uh, our children and that's me completely editorializing so i apologize for that no, but, but know, it, I, uh, right and i think it has felt at times cruel. Like I do watch the press conferences as much as they're painful for me to watch. I do watch them because I have to hear what they say, but they'll make statements. I think the last one, he said something about a 40% absenteeism rate with teachers, which on its own, first of all, we all looked at each other like 40%. Where, where is that number coming from? It makes teachers sound like they're all staying home, calling it sick. <laughs> like there's no context. There's no explanation of that number. Is that because of, I'm still not sure where they get that number from. I don't know anyone who, unless they were told to stay home because they were a close contact of a COVID case, I'm not hearing that, but they're, they're citing these numbers. They talk about March break and dangling March break when people are at their breaking point. Kids and teachers, I'm hearing from both sides, they need a break. It's been that, ridiculous. That has to be the most asinine argument I have yet to hear out of this government's mouth is let's cancel March break. Because the student, the students need to catch up, and I'm like, what, what do you think they've been doing? Like my my <laughs> my my kid, you I a I'm like, you're the ones who locked down the schools, um, because you let the you let COVID get out of control, so you had to lock them down. Fine, you sent my kid in to her bedroom to to go on a computer so she could learn with her classmates online. She. Their, their teacher was doing that for five days a week from from the bell ring to end of day. She didn't miss any school. None of those kids, no kid has missed school unless they 
purposely just didn't log on that day. Like, I, I don't understand this notion, like somehow they're behind or they're failing. In which case, I'm, I'm kind of like, well, that's your fault, Minister Lecce and Dr. Williams, because you're the one who let COVID get this out of control that you were forced to shut down our schools. But it continues to build the narrative of a broken system that's not working, which I think is probably the bigger intention there. And, and the, uh, the offering of summer catch up, like they're offering summer school to catch up. And I'm thinking the last thing kids are w- going to want to do come June is sit in front of the computer in July and August and do more school. Um, and there, I'm sure there are some that will take advantage of it. I, but I want, I want it, them to prove the fact that kids are falling behind. Let's just start with that assumption. Cause I, I don't see it. I've, I'm involved in my board's uh, uh, parental levels and I talked with other parents in the board and they're like, no, my kid logs on, they do their thing. They don't like it, but they still do it. So I'm like, where's the failure? Like where, where, where have teachers not stepped up to the plate here and adapted and made this work? Like where have kids well, been I failing? Guess, I think there are, The other part of it is, and this is something that we knew going into the pandemic, but boy, did the pandemic drive at home was the inequities in the system. So some kids in some houses have been able to be okay and have a quiet place to work and their own computer and all of the resources they need. Other students in other houses have not had that. They haven't had a safe, quiet room. They're sharing one computer with five siblings if they have a computer, if they have Wi-Fi. So there are students who are being left behind right now and they're of grave concern. They came to our attention immediately. As soon as the pandemic started, that was something we were aware of immediately of the kids that were not, um, we were not able to reach. We were literally driving and dropping things off at people's houses because they remember they had the school bus route set up to drop off packages, paper and pencil, because there were no other options. If, if only the government were sitting on $6 billion in unspent funds, <laughs> Oh, don't even get me started. <laughs> um, you know, geez, if if only we had that kind of money to spend on students on a provincial level, who knew? Who knew? I know that's been extremely frustrating. Extre- and I, I'm looking at Twitter. It's where I watch to see what my peeps across the province are saying. And they, they're showing up today. And like, I don't see extra PPE. I don't see any of, nothing is different in terms of safety measures or money spent to make this safer. So there's supposed to be increased testing. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll believe that when I see it, but I, I like, we're not, we're not still not working on trying to decrease, uh, student numbers in a, in the classroom. We're not trying, we haven't yet figured out how to get to that magic 15 students per classroom level. Um, well, it's happening in secondary. Now secondary is pretty good at low class numbers because they have shit, but elementary, Oh no! Like that, that's that's the thing is that we're not like we haven't really, we're, you know, we're not. I don't know. We're, I just I found that we 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 kind of gave up on that, and it's just shrug our shoulders. Well, you know, we did everything we could, which was not anything. Yeah, that's me editorializing. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's well, been hard it to should... watch, and it's been hard to watch friends who mm-hmm. I log on with them, and I look at them, and it's like, are are you okay? They look like they've aged 10 years, like they're just, they're worried about their kids. They're exhausted. They don't know what's literally things change on a dime and they will get, I was talking to someone today who got a call the night before that he was teaching. He was not, he was a centrally assigned person without a class. He got a call on a Sunday night that he was teaching grade three the next day. Go. (laughs) (laughs) That is not an easy thing to pull off overnight. A class of grade threes for a five hour day. Uh, it's just so much uncertainty. And we know human beings do not do well when they have no control over their situation and uncertainty. And I think that's the whole system has been like that. Part of it's unavoidable. And I think a large part of it has been very avoidable. And that goes back to the ministry. Well, I think that's probably a, a good place to uh, uh, to to draw this to a close. Um, so I see that we're approaching the three quarters of an hour mark. Thanks so much for uh, joining us again, Cindy. Really appreciate you uh, coming on and sharing your expertise. Um, uh, and I suspect we'll be back here again before um, before too many months uh, have passed again. So uh, thanks so much happy for to come and talk about <laughs> 
to to spout out about education. That's, well, that's 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 what we like. We like heated uh, heated uh, uh, passionate uh, statements. Mm. <laughs> yeah, happy um, to be here. Yeah, so thanks so much. Awesome. Take care. Stay well. That's it for this episode of the 905er. Thank you for listening. As always, you can send us your feedback, thoughts, and concerns, or ideas for future episodes to our email, info at 905er.ca. We'd love to hear from you. You can help us keep the 905er going by financially supporting us through Patreon as well as PayPal. Visit us at 905er.ca and click on the support tab. As well, links are in the show notes for your convenience. Lastly, you can find us on social media. Search for the underscore 905er on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. So long for now. See you next time. to make the most out of this life and optimize your personal wellness then check out the natural man podcast join me host mike c as we explore all areas of human wellness physical mental and emotional learn strategies to optimize your own well-being and be in the driver's seat of your own health remember your doctor works for you learn biohacks neurohacks ways to improve sleep and ways to optimize your body and your mind. Check us out on Apple, Spotify, the Fountain app, and at naturalmanpodcast.com.